most, of, most people in the world, at least in Western civilization, are familiar with the Bible. When I say familiar, I mean they, they, they know it exists. Uh, the Bible, I mean, is, is accessible in many languages. It's accessible from an a expense standpoint. Uh, many of you have an have a, a electronic device, a phone, a tablet with a Bible app on it that didn't cost you anything. And there are more translations and versions and languages that you can really even begin to read. Um, but as I think about the Bible, the Bible didn't have my accident. It's not like all of a sudden the Bible's there. And in, in fact, you want a, a trivia a question that the first person to present the 66 books that we call the Bible was a guy by the name of Athanasius in 367. Now, 367, we're talking about over 300 years after Jesus has died. Now, we're finally getting this formalized Bible. And, and people ask the question, how do we know the Bible is true? How do we know the Bible has exactly what God wants us to have? Well, part of what we're calling a question of, do we have a loving God or not? If, if we have a loving God, why, how, how can we reconcile that with him giving us a Bible that's inadequate? Giving us his word that doesn't lead us to him. And so we trust that the Bible has truth. That it has all we need in order to get to Jesus. That's what, what, what we recognize about the Bible. And, and, and Christianity in general is referred to as a revealed religion. And what that means is anything we know about God is because he has revealed himself to us. It's not as though someone reads some intellectual height, oh, I've discovered God now. No, that, that's, God reveals himself to us. He makes himself known, and through the Bible, we can know God, we can know his expectations for us, have a great understanding of what it means to serve God in this world by knowing his word. But as I think about the truth that we have in God and the truth that God reveals to us, I, I come across this concept of tolerance. And, and the world claims to be tolerant. But the world's tolerance is not a two-way street. You know, the world claims to be tolerant, but actually they're fairly intolerant. And when we look at it from the outside perspective, Christians, on one hand, should be the most tolerant individuals ever. And part of that is because we all recognize we start in the same spot. We're sinners. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Everybody is a sinner. So if somebody does not know Jesus, there is no benefit for me to judge them. I recognize they're a sinner. They need Jesus. I'm just ahead of them on the spiritual development side of things. Because I've met Jesus. They haven't. And so for me to judge them for not believing in Jesus makes no sense. But I think the problem sometimes comes in is that we allow tolerance to creep into inappropriate areas. It's one thing to be tolerant to somebody who doesn't know Jesus. You know, we just love them. You know, if you don't know Jesus today, man, we're glad you're here. You know, we want to love you. We want to show you the love of Jesus. But someone like me, I was born and raised in the church. If you're doing the math, it means I've almost been in the church for 35 years. At some point, I've got to get my act together, right? We can't just tolerate the sin in my life. I know better. You know, there's that phrase, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. In the church, a lot of times, we, uh, we claim to be intolerant towards sin, but yet there's a lot of sins I think we tend to ignore. Probably one of the, the most pervasive ones, or at least obvious ones that we talk about, is that of gossip. You know, we, we, we cover gossip well, right? Hey, I've got a prayer request for you. Right? We, we do that. But, but I think gossip is deeper than just talking about somebody else. I think it goes deeper into the words we actually say. Philippians, or, sorry, Philippians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, the Apostle Paul writes, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Every once in a while, 
you'll see this new scandal. I say every once in a while, it's like every other week now, about some celebrity or politician or some high-ranking person in some nonprofit organization. Their emails uncovered or tweets from 12 years ago how they made an insensitive comment. And, and to be honest, my first reaction is, who has the time to go look through the tweet from 12 years ago? Right? That, that, that's kind of, come on. Like, why are we wasting our time on that? But I also read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, and say, if all my language is good and beneficial, is anybody ever going to read something about what I said that could be used in that way? And I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm, 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 I'm sure, sure there are many people who are really good people who have said some dumb things. But the way we talk about others needs to be good, needs to be beneficial. Because that's G Jesus sees our flaws. He knows what's wrong with you, and he doesn't gossip about you. He loves you. He wants better for you. So you may know things about people that aren't good, that they need to change, but you don't need to share that. You don't need to go telling other people. You don't need to put people down. We need to have language that's good, that's beneficial, that's wholesome, that's not foul or abusive. The words we say matter. And I know they teach you as a little kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And, and sometimes we need, to, we need to suck it up and move on and not pay attention to the noise. But we also need to make sure our contribution is good and beneficial. Jesus calls you to be the salt of the earth. Matthew chapter 5. No, he calls us to enhance the world, not make it worse. But we're going to look today at the, the passage we looked at last week, John chapter 8, starting verse 2, where Jesus is confronted by the religious leaders. Because I, I think there's a subtle point about tolerance that is driven through this whole interaction of, of things that are highlighted and things that are ignored. Because in John chapter 8, verse 2, Jesus is up early and he goes to the temple. A crowd soon gathers and Jesus sits down to teach them. As he is speaking, the religious leaders bring a woman who was caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. They ask Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law says we are to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap Jesus into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. So there are two things happening here. The first is a very normal thing. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, in the temple. He is teaching in a religious setting to a crowd that gathered. That was a very normal thing. But then the religious leaders <clears throat> excuse me, parade a woman caught in the act of adultery. A very unusual way for them to handle this situation. Unusual for them to parade a, somebody accused of a sin in such a, a disrespectful and embarrassing manner. It was unusual for them to come without other witnesses or other facts about this situation. There was no evidence presented. They had no compassion for the actual individual. The religious leaders were not seeking justice. They were seeking to embarrass the woman and drive their own agenda. Now, they were presenting something as a factual case. Leviticus chapter 20 talks about adultery and how those who are caught in the act of adultery should be dealt with. Now, when you read Leviticus 20, there are several different scenarios that are actually presented there. Some, uh, the, the Leviticus 20 says the person should be stoned to death. Others say there should be grace or compassion or this punishment or that. And as I think about Jesus and, and this interaction that he's having, Jesus knew what Leviticus chapter 20 said. But if Jesus would have talked to the religious leader and say, well, what are the facts of the case? Well, in this situation, this applies. In this situation, that applies. And then what Jesus would have been doing is he would have been engaging in their game. Jesus doesn't engage in our manipulative schemes. You know, you've probably had this the conversation, Jesus, if you do this, I'll do that. Right? When we're desperate, you know, that's, that's a tendency that people have. You know, we try to barter with Jesus. 
Jesus doesn't need our stuff. He just wants us. And that's all we have to offer him is us. So Jesus doesn't engage in that. He, he didn't engage in the game the political or the religious leaders were playing because they were just trying to trap Jesus. And then we have the tension between the Old Testament law and the Roman law. And if Jesus followed one, then he would be breaking the other and vice versa. And so they were either trying to trap him politically or religiously. But either way, Jesus answers this question. They could use it against him. But Jesus doesn't. He doesn't engage. He doesn't fall into that trap. He sees that the religious leaders are ignoring certain things that they're not doing what they're supposed to, that they are dishonoring God. And we have to be careful that we don't fall into that same trap of not doing the things we're supposed to, that we're dishonoring God. Because another sin that we sometimes tend to ignore is that of indifference or apathy. And if we want to get real pointed, sometimes we can call it laziness. Now, Now, indifference and apathy aren't always laziness, but they can be. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 18, says, Laziness leads to a sagging roof. Idleness leads to a leaky house. No one wants water coming in through their their attic. That's never a good sign. No one's ever excited about that. And what Ecclesiastes is saying is we need to be proactive. We need to do the work. We need to not just wait for the emergency to arise before we actually do something about it. We need to work all the time. Jesus calls it something different. But there are many people who try to follow Jesus by only absorbing. There are many people who who are like the sponge, but they don't give anything away. They just take and take and take. Now, I, I think I've said this before. But if you aren't serving in the name of Jesus, you're following Jesus wrong. Jesus should make us uncomfortable. You remember Mark chapter 10? Jesus, he didn't say, I came to be served. No, he said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. If Jesus can serve, we have no excuse. Jesus, we affirm, is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. There's nobody higher than Jesus. And if Jesus can serve, then we need to serve as well. We can't allow indifference and apathy to allow us an excuse. Now, now there are times where you're going through a season in life that's busy, that's difficult, for whatever we want to categorize that as. But at some point, it's no longer a season, it's life. And Jesus calls us to serve in life. We can't allow excuses to allow us to be indifferent and apathetic. We are called to be active participants in the kingdom of God now. We're not waiting. We are active now. But Jesus didn't engage in the religious leaders, so they kept demanding an answer. So Jesus stood up, and he looked at them, and he said, all right. Well, let the one who has never sinned cast the first stone. And then he stooped down and wrote in the dust again. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left with the woman in the crowd. And Jesus wrote in the dirt. Another way to translate that word wrote that we have in the English would that be to register. So maybe, uh, and I think I talked about this last week, Jesus was registering the complaint of the religious leaders. Maybe he was writing the sins of the woman or the sins of the religious leaders. But you think about writing in the dirt as it wipes away. Whatever Jesus was writing there was not a permanent fixture. Jesus was addressing or wasn't engaging in their game and he finally confronted them. And he gave them a solution. He gave them the option of whoever was without sin can cast the first stone. Now, if you remember from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet he was without sin. So the only one qualified to cast the first stone was Jesus. 
and we'll find later Jesus didn't actually cast the stone, but nobody else there was qualified. Jesus didn't address their legal question. He moved beyond it, and he confronted the core of their motivation. They weren't worried about sin. If they were worried about sin, then they would take care of their own spiritual lives. They were worried about getting Jesus out of the way because he was hindering what they wanted to do. Jesus had compassion on the woman. His first and ultimate objective is not to condemn us for our sins, but to save us. And we recognize that, which is why, for those who don't know Jesus, we're tolerant. We love and say, hey, here's Jesus. I want you to meet this Savior of mine. But at some point, we need to say we can't allow sin to exist in our lives. We have to move past it. Because the religious leaders, they looked the part. They, they, they looked holy. They looked put together. They looked like they were exactly where they should be from a spiritual standpoint, but yet they still had sin in their lives. We need to make sure we don't act like the religious leaders and just go on these crusades telling everybody else how bad they are. We need to make sure we eradicate the sin in our own lives. It's not about somebody else. It's about you. It's about me. Don't be thinking about somebody else. Think about you. Because if we don't, if we don't take care of our spiritual lives first, then we have the tendency to act like the religious leaders and use people, use other people as objects, as things, as something that can help us manipulate the system for our own personal benefit. But another sin I think we sometimes neglect is that of lying. Now, lying is one of the Ten Commandments. It's the ninth one. We find it in, the, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. It says, you shall not bear false witness. Don't lie. Tell the truth. Now, we have to be careful, and we have to pair this with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. It says, don't let any unwholesome talk come from your mouth. Just because it's the truth doesn't mean you need to say it. Right? Just because it's right and accurate, it can be mean. So, so let's, let's make sure we, we don't just use this as an as a, uh, avenue to give us freedom to do whatever we would like. But, but you know, there, there are studies that show, in general, people lie. I've, I saw some as conservatives as people lie three to five times a day, up to over a hundred times a day. And I think it sometimes depends on how you classify a lie. If, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, how are you doing? You know, the two responses, I'm, I'm good or I'm okay. That's not always the case. Now, if you're, if you're interacting with an acquaintance, you know, you're, you're not going to spill your emotional baggage. But if you're meeting with your best friend, you probably are, or you, you have more of a freedom. To, uh, so, so maybe that is or isn't a lie. But we tend to embellish, we tend to hide. Uh, one of my... One of my pet peeves is I hate getting asked questions that only have one right answer. That, that just, that, 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 and, and they're not rhetorical. rhetorical. They are, they're non-rhetorical questions that only have one right answer. Prob and, and Hannah does not do this to me, so this is just hypothetical. Um, she, she, it, there, there's the, the, probably the stereotypical question is, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> there's only one right answer there. Right? I mean, I mean, no one asks that question wanting honesty. They don't. And, and I, I, so, I mean, that, that, that's, that's I, what, what do you say to that? I mean, uh, I played the fifth. That's, a, that's pretty indicting in and of itself. <laughs> but, but, but we have to be careful how we interact. But sometimes I, I think we, we use excuses. You know, you say, this, I didn't have time for that. Well, you just didn't make time. And so maybe it, it depends on how we actually answer questions, how we define what a lie is or isn't. But we tend to lie to ourselves as well. And I, I, I think I've used this analogy before, uh, but, but if you've got a pizza, and let's say you're counting calories. I don't, I don't know why you would eat pizza and count calories at the same time. That's just depressing. <laughs> but, um, and, and, and let's say 
each piece of pizza is, uh, is hypothetical. We'll say it's only 100 calories. Praise the Lord, right? 100 pieces. Uh, so so you, 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 the piece, piece of pizza, each piece of pizza is 100 calories. But you've got a really big piece and a really small piece. What are you going to do? I know what I do. Is I go for that really big piece. No, that's 100 calories. Praise the Lord. Right? So, so we lie to ourselves. We embellish. And, and even though we know... Now, I don't know how you would necessarily rectify that situation, but I hope sometimes we have these subtle things that we allow in our lives. You know, saying I didn't have time may sometimes be accurate, but usually it's, I just didn't make time. We have these things that we have to make sure we don't embellish or downplay. And, and you know, we come to the church so we can speak spiritually speaking. You know, I don't have money to tithe. I don't have resources to give. I don't have time to serve. Everybody has the same amount of time. And we all don't have the same amount of financial resources. But I think it calls for mutual sacrifice, regardless of what we're talking about, whether we're talking about financial, whether we're talking about time, energy, effort. You know, following Jesus requires sacrifice, but we tend not to get bothered by, you know, I'm I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to engage. I'm going to avoid that. But push comes to shove eventually, and even though the religious leaders had all left, Jesus asks, he stands up, and he asks the woman, he says, where are your accusers? Didn't even one condemn you? And she says, no. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. So nobody condemned her. She was a sinner. According to the facts that they presented, she had clearly broken the Old Testament law and the punishment should be imposed upon her. It was a clear-cut legal situation. But yet nobody condemned her. And Jesus then acquitted her. He gave her grace. He gave her freedom. He gave her salvation. He forgave her of her sins. He gave her grace. But this grace is not a license to sin however he says go and sin no more leave this place of condemnation leave that sinful life and go live a new life break free from the old and enter the new in Jesus see the religious leaders were playing religious games they're playing political games trying to pursue and further their own agenda But Jesus says the old way is no longer how it works. There's a new life. There's a new beginning. There's a new freedom that we can find in Jesus Christ. But in order to do so, we can't allow sin in our lives. When sin surfaces, we need to eradicate it as quickly as possible. Because you know, Jesus, he knows your sin. He knows the temptations that you have in your life. But Jesus, first and foremost, does not want to condemn. When you've got sin in your life, Jesus' reaction is not to condemn you. He says, let me take that. Let me give you freedom from that burden. Let me save you from the sin in your life. But it's so hard to recognize sometimes. And I think one of the hardest ones to recognize is idolatry. We read the Old Testament and we see they worship these objects like the golden calf. We don't have those same types of things in this world today. We don't worship those things. Now, now we, we, we worship things. We have idolatry. A lot of us have these wonderful big black boxes hanging on the wall that we can point a remote at and be entertained for hours. We have these comforts. We have these nice cars. We have these nice devices. We have this great food. Comfort is a huge idol in our world. And we've got to be careful that our comfort doesn't come before Jesus. But, but when, when I think about, about things like our television, social media, our devices, it, it's, it's hard not to get overwhelmed. Because what we allow into our life disciples us, it influences us, it, it, it affects us. So whether we're talking about the, the, the news we watch, the, the, the movies we see, the social media we interact with can consume us. 
And those things can become idols, and they bring fear into our lives. And a 30-minute sermon is not going to fix 12 hours of watching the news. And the 15 minutes a day you spend reading your Bible and praying doesn't compare to the six episodes of that show you binge watched that night. We can't allow other things to influence us more than Jesus. And when they do, they become idols. But Jesus calls us to a new life. We can't tolerate sin in our lives at all. We've got to get rid of it. We have to have the courage to identify it. Because any sin in your life pulls you away from Jesus. If you don't have sin or don't think you have sin, I fear you're just lying to yourself. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but to recognize that sin is a big deal and it's dangerous. But there's, there's one more sin that, that I, I, I think is hidden in the religious leaders today. Because this situation in which the religious leaders bring this woman caught in the act of adultery to Jesus did not happen in a vacuum. It's not as though one day they woke up and said, you know what? Let's get Jesus' opinion on this. There was history and context that led to the religious leaders doing this. Because the way they did it did not honor God. The way they did it was trying to trap Jesus, was trying to delegitimize Jesus, discredit him so they could push him out of the way and continue with the status quo. You know, we read the Gospels and we see Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders. And there are many times when the, the, the interactions between Jesus and the religious leaders make the religious leaders, whether we call it foolish, whether they put in their place, we show the error of their ways. And I don't think the religious leaders, for the most part, left their interactions with Jesus saying, man, that guy knows what he's talking about. You know, the one exception might be Nicodemus. Read the Gospel of John and see Nicodemus the three times he appears and how you can see he's wrestling. John 3.16 is a powerful moment, or John chapter 3, and 16 is in there, but it's a powerful moment of Nicodemus is asking Jesus a question. You can see he's wrestling with what is Jesus talking about? That's the exception. You know what I think all the others did? Jesus would have this interaction and they, they would... They would look foolish or be put in their place, show the error of their ways. And they would leave, and they would grumble with each other. They would go grumble and complain, I can't believe this Jesus. Who does he think he is? I'm a religious leader. I'm whatever that may be. And, and, and they, they grumble and they complain. But this situation in John 8 didn't happen in a vacuum. There were many interactions before then. And so... They had many negative interactions, and they got madder and madder and madder, and they grumbled more and more and more, and their anger rose and rose, and so finally said, you know, we got this idea. We got to get rid of Jesus. We got to discredit him. So they brought the woman, caught in the act of adultery, paraded her in front of the crowd and said, Jesus, what do you think? Knowing that whether, whichever answer Jesus gives would put him in a difficult situation at best. But as I think about what they did, you know, they left. They walked away one by one. But you know, the story doesn't stop there. I imagine that after that interaction with Jesus here in John chapter 8, they got together and they grumbled some more. They complained some more. Their anger rose and festered and grew and grew. You remember where it led to? led to death. Religious leaders were instrumental in killing Jesus. They brought the charges against Jesus because they were so mad at him, and it started with grumbling. It started with complaining. It started with them saying, we don't want our life disrupted. We want our preferences to happen. Now, I, uh, I used to do some substitute teaching. And that's very interesting. 
and, and, and I substitute from kindergarten up to high school, and, and, and I substitute for two days this fifth grade class. And, and the first day I, I subbed, uh, they're a great group of students, a, a fairly intelligent group of students, um, but I just noticed they were a bunch of complainers. Like anything and everything, they were just moan and groan, and I'm just like, man, this is ridiculous. Now, I didn't really care, but I just, okay, whatever. So I subbed for two days. That was the first day. The second day, I had an idea. This, this particular school building had high incentives for a class if the substitute teacher gave them high marks. I can't remember what the incentive was, but it was a big deal. And so the bell rings, class starts, and I tell them, all right, guys, got a deal for you. I'm going to give you that gold star or whatever it is for the substitute teacher if for the entire day we can have zero complaints. No groaning, no grumbling, no complaining all day. There was one time during the day where they, I said, are you guys complaining? No, 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 we're not, we're not. And, and, and they actually, they did fantastic. I gave them the high marks. They, they did really well. We, one of the observations I take away from that day is day two was a lot quieter than day one. When we take complaining and grumbling off the table, we don't have a lot to talk about anymore. We don't. You know, our world is full of grumbling and complaining. And that includes the church. You know what? The one thing we grumble and complain about the most? The drums. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> or, or whoever was over there doing that, so... <laughs> And, and, you know, I'm grateful that Steve played today. That's great. Awesome. Thank you, Steve, for playing. Um, and and uh, Sam is, our, is the one who normally plays drums. Sam, are you, Sam, is, Sam is in his 20s. Um, Sam is here every single Saturday, every single Sunday, playing those drums. I probably hear 101 complaints versus compliments about Sam. Now, now, I'm not trying to glorify Sam. I'm just trying to highlight. We grumble and complain about that. That drum has nothing to do with theology. It has nothing to do with the truth about Jesus Christ. Now, now, I'm not saying we should ignore our personal preferences. But what would happen if from now until the end of the calendar year, we said, you know what, I'm not going to complain at all. What would happen? We'd be a lot quieter. <laughs> he, he, here's a secret for you. It's bad, and everybody knows it. I don't care what we're talking about. I don't care if we're talking about, about for the politics, talking about your job, talking about your neighbor, talking about this, that, or the other that just bothers you. It's bad, and everybody knows it. We all know it's bad. But instead of saying, let's groan and complain about it, let's say, no, how do we see this through the lens of Jesus? The religious leaders grumbled and complained about Jesus constantly, and it led to death. And if we're not careful, the grumbling and complaining in our life can lead to death. So, so I want to challenge you. And, and, and it may not work outside of the church setting from now until the end of the year. Let's not grumble or complain. Let's just see what happens. I mean, I mean and, and now we can share our preferences. I'm not saying you should ignore anything that just bothers you. But let's just stop grumbling and complaining. And I, I don't want to glorify Sam. That's not my point. But that's just a prime example of how sometimes we get our eyes taken off of Jesus and we put them on our personal preferences. On, on, and, and they may be good. You may be right. You may be valid. But let's make sure we focus more on Jesus than anything else.